Today is Wednesday, March 1st. We're very glad that you joined us tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're here together to study the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 38 tonight, so I want to invite you to join me in Genesis 38 in a copy of your own Bible. That would help as we study through this. If you need footnotes or cross-references, that might help in the study so we get more out of it. But while you're here, we want to also invite you to join us for Bible study at 9.30 and then also for worship at 10.30 this coming Lord's Day morning. And as always, if you have any questions about what you see or hear taught in class tonight, we would invite you to give us a call at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. You can send a text or uh, call us using your voice on that number. We would love to hear from you either way. And you could also send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com or stop by the church's website, which is fourlakeschurch.org. And if you've not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, this would be a great time to do that. So we want to invite you to, uh, to like the channel or subscribe or whatever you do, uh, just so you can get updates in the future. But we are back to Genesis, which is the book of beginnings written by Moses. We've also, at this point, we've looked at Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, last week we transitioned to Joseph, but tonight we take a brief detour to consider a rather unusual scene from the life of Judah, so the fourth son of Jacob. And next week we'll get back to Joseph. So we have, so we have just a little bit of a uh, kind of out of order, but it's very important, and I think you'll understand why once we get through this class tonight. But to put this in the larger context, we are looking at Judah tonight. So I've put this uh, big red rectangle right around Judah in the chart that we've been using over the past couple months. So Judah is the fourth son of Jacob. Judah is the focus here in Genesis chapter 38. So let's start tonight then with Genesis chapter 38 and by uh, we'll look at the first five verses. So Genesis 38 verses 1 through 5. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. Then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan. She bore another son and named him Shelah, and it was a Chezbib, or Chezib that she bore him. Well, for some reason, Judah heads out away from his family, maybe just to get away, maybe to find something, but he gets away from his brothers. He visits this Adulamite by the name of Hira, and again, we aren't told exactly why he does this, but while he's there, he runs into one of the locals, uh, the daughter of a guy named Shua, and he has relations with this woman, and she bears a son, and they name him Ur. Uh, they also have Onan, and then they also have Shelah, two more sons for a total of three. So this isn't some quick visit. This isn't just passing through. Uh, but Judah heads off for quite some time, a number of years at least, at least enough time to have three sons by this woman. And it happens in a village named Chezib. Chezib is located almost straight, uh, straight west of, of uh, Bethlehem, about halfway between Bethlehem and the Mediterranean Sea. So if you can kind of picture that in your mind or uh, take out a map in the back of your Bible, most Bibles these days uh, would have that. But even in this first paragraph, I think we get the idea that this chapter will not end well. Something is going on here. Judah uh, gets intimate with this Canaanite, a, a local woman. This has the, uh, this is what the patriarchs of this family have warned about for several generations now. Don't get your wives from among the locals. You got to go back to our people up in Iran. And, and so instead of doing that, um, Judah goes and he gets apparently a wife or a woman, has children with this woman uh, from among those uh, who are local. So not from among those who have similar beliefs, but he gets this woman from among the pagans. But this is where we are. Uh, there's not even a reference really to marriage yet at this point. I think that's going to come later. I think that reference is later in this chapter. Uh, but Judah here at the beginning has three sons with this Canaanite woman. So let's continue with Genesis 38, verses 6 through 11. Genesis 38, verses 6 through 11. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, 
So when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I am afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. So there's no reference to a wife for Judah yet, but Judah gets this wife for his firstborn son. So a woman named Tamar. And that'll be a familiar name to us, I think, by the time this uh, chapter is over. And verse 7 is rather shocking because his firstborn son, Ur, is so evil that the Lord just kills him. The Lord just takes his life right there. And I don't think we've really seen this before, have we? I mean, we've seen God uh, banish Cain. You would think if anybody was going to get killed on the spot, it would have been Cain. Um, we've seen the flood, obviously, but uh, this guy just seems to make God so mad that he just kills him right then and there. And this leaves Tamar as a widow. So Judah then tells his secondborn son to have relations with his sister-in-law uh, so that she can have children, probably to take care of her in her old age. But of course, Onan knows that these won't be his kids. Uh, he'll be responsible for raising them, but uh, they're the ones who are going to get the inheritance, not him, and so on. And so, um, and so he refuses. He goes into his brother's wife. He finishes there on the ground, but this makes God mad, so God kills him too, uh, just like he had killed his older brother. Well, obviously Judah sees this as not going well. <laughs> He's not going to have too many left here. And so he basically tells Tamar to go back home to her father and to wait for Judah's third son, Shelah, to grow up. And, and notice Judah's fear in verse 11. He's afraid that Shelah may die like his brothers. And I'm wondering whether Judah maybe can see that the locals are influencing his children. So like this is not going well. Something is not right. And we're not told, but Judah wants his third son to grow up to, uh, you know, grow up a little bit before uh, taking care of, of Tamar. So meanwhile, Tamar is sent home uh, back to her father, back for him to take care of her for a little while. And that's kind of where we leave it at the end of this paragraph. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 38 verses 12 through 19. Genesis 38 verses 12 through 19. Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. It was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of a name, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that Shelah had grown up and she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Here now, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me, that you may come into me? He said, Therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, Moreover, will you give me a pledge until you send it? He said, What pledge shall I give you? And she said, Your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garments. Well, only in verse 12 do we find that Judah has actually married the Canaanite woman, Shua's daughter. But here we find that she dies. And after the time of mourning, Judah heads out to check on his sheep shearers. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we learned that Jacob uh, left Haran when Laban had gone up to be with his sheep shearers. You may remember we shared a picture of some sheep being sheared at the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival uh, that happens over in Jefferson every September. Uh, but here Judah heads out to check on his sheep shearers and Tamar, Judah's pretty much neglected and forgotten daughter-in-law, hears that Judah is headed in that direction. So Judah's going to be nearby and so she takes off her widow's garments and this woman dresses like a prostitute. And just an interesting kind of side note here, at this time prostitutes were apparently known for covering their faces with veils. And so if you saw a woman out there by the side of the road covered and uh, having her face covered, you would probably assume she was a prostitute. But I kind of find it interesting that this cultural practice apparently changes over time. So by the time we get to 1 Corinthians, for example, uh, you may remember that prostitutes could be identified as those who did not cover their heads. 
And uh, that, of course, is where Paul warns against women going around with their heads uncovered so as not to give the wrong impression, if I understand that uh, whole chapter correctly. But I'm just hoping we note how customs have a way of uh, changing over time, sometimes uh, even being completely opposite of what they were a number of years earlier. So we just need to be aware of that. And I guess if we could illustrate this in some bizarre way, if, if we could imagine... Uh, if it were a thing that all Satan worshipers were known for wearing red bandanas, well, uh, we as God's people may want to think twice about going out in town wearing a red bandana. I don't know if that, probably not a perfect illustration, uh, but there are times when certain things that, the, that, that we wear, maybe certain ways that we behave, might indicate something. So we at least need to be aware of that danger. So we need to be aware of the culture around us. Well, in this passage, uh, we find that Tamar dresses like a prostitute, and her reasoning is she's going to set a trap for Judah. And it's interesting to me that she knows that Judah might be susceptible to this. So she knows something about this man. So Judah is the kind of man who may be in the habit of stopping to visit prostitutes, and she takes advantage of this. It, it works. Uh, Judah sees her, assumes she is a prostitute based on the way she's dressed here, and, uh, and he stops, not knowing that this woman is his own daughter-in-law. However, it's almost as if he's left his wallet at home. I think that may be the way we would put that today. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't happen to have a goat on him at the time to pay this woman. And so they work out a deal. He promises a goat. And since he doesn't have it on him at the time, she agrees to hold his staff and his cord and his seal. So some kind of like a signet ring, which of course was big back then. And she's going to hold this as a pledge, as a guarantee that he really will come back and uh, bring her the goat. Um, I'm kind of thinking of when we uh, rent a kayak at uh, Wingra Boats over there on uh, Lake Wingra off of uh, Knickerbocker Street. So you ride your bike over there, and they don't just give you a kayak, but uh, a lot of times they have to hold your driver's license or hold a credit card or something like that. And so maybe a similar thing is going on here. So they make this deal, they have relations, and then we find here that Tamar conceives. And then she, she takes off this veil, she heads back home with her widow's clothing put back on. So let's continue with Genesis 38 verses 20 through 23, the next paragraph. Genesis 38 verses 20 through 23. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the men of her place, saying, Where is the temple prostitute who was by the side of the road, or by the road at Enaim? But they said, There has been no uh, temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said, There has been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, Let her keep them. Otherwise, we will become a laughing stock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. Well, starting in verse 20, Judah starts to get, I think, just some small hint of a clue that, uh, that he's been had. There's something going on here. He sends the goat by his friend. His friend not only can't find the prostitute, uh, but the men of that area have no idea what he's talking about. There's never been a prostitute here. And at this point, Judah does the best he can, I think, in my mind, kind of to back away slowly. And he just backs away so as not to become a laughing stock. It's not going to go well for me if I start digging around for this woman. Nothing good can come of that. And I think we can just imagine in our minds Judah wandering through the wilderness with a goat looking to pay this prostitute from a few months back. And uh, very quickly that uh, he would in fact become a laughing stock to everybody. And uh, so, so he just gives up and he just kind of lets this woman keep the staff and the seal and the cord. And I think at this point he just hopes that this thing goes away. So let's continue on then with Genesis 38 verses 24 through 26. Genesis 38 verses 24 through 26. Now it was about three months later that Judah was informed your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold, she is also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law, saying, I am with child by the man to whom these things belong. And she said, Please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, 
inasmuch as I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not have relations with her again. So three months later, Judah finds out that his daughter-in-law Tamar has been working as a prostitute, that she's pregnant. And of course his reaction is, let's burn the woman. And as they are getting ready to drag her out, as I see this, as I read this paragraph, she whips out the ring and the cords and the staff. And she identifies, or wants to have him identify, the owner of these items. And it's, it's this guy who's the father. You know, examine these things very carefully and, and you decide. And Judah, of course, uh, sees where this is going. He sees exactly what's going on here. There's apparently no burning of any prostitutes on this day. Uh, but instead, he seems to realize what he's done. And, uh, you know, not just the immorality of, of uh, having relations with a prostitute. That, that doesn't even seem to be the real thing he's concerned about here. Uh, but the real issue here is that he now sees, really, that he has wronged this woman by not um, giving her to his son. If you remember, Shalah was son number three. Sons numbers one and two had died, killed by God for their immorality. And in their culture, it was now his turn to take care of his sister-in-law. Uh, but Judah was keeping that from happening. And Tamar is languishing alone without children. She's not getting any younger. A number of years have gone by. And she's there hanging out with her uh, dad. And uh, Judah now finally sees that this is wrong and that he, in fact, needs to do something about it. So let's conclude tonight with Genesis 38, verses 27 through 30. Genesis 38, verses 27 through 30. It came about at the time she was giving birth that, behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came about as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. Then she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. Afterward, his brother came out, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zerah. So we have this rather unusual, just weird account, don't we, as Tamar gives birth to twins. So one sticks a hand out first, and the midwife ties a thread around it, like this is son number one, but he pulls it back, and his brother is then born first instead. That's weird, isn't it? I've never heard of that kind of thing happening, but I think it reminds us at least a little bit of the birth of Jacob and Esau, doesn't it? Remember? Uh, in that they were twins, in that uh, Jacob came out holding on to Esau's heel, and there was this prophecy that the older would serve the younger, so kind of flip-flop the opposite of what we might expect. Uh, but in this situation, the, the actual firstborn is named Perez, or breach, or breakthrough. And the second one is named Zerah, meaning to rise or to come forth. So this is our chapter tonight, and it's been a strange one, hasn't it? We've had a few things going on here, and uh, kind of a kind of a weird account, a couple of weird accounts here. And, and I think we need to ask, you know, why is this weird account found in the Bible? Why, why have we even taken time to think about this? You know, why do we have Genesis chapter 38? Well, for one, I guess it would be a bit weird just to go right from Genesis 37 to 39. You know, 38 is missing. Of course, those chapter divisions were not in the original manuscript. So, so we really need to ask, why do we have this? Why do we have Joseph in chapter 37, Joseph in chapter 39, and then why do we have this little detour concerning Judah in Genesis 38? And, and I think to answer these questions, we need to think about where else we read about Tamar in the Bible. Doesn't that sound familiar? Haven't we read about Tamar even in the New Testament? So I think we need to note how Matthew starts his gospel account in Matthew 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. This is what he says. This is how the New Testament starts. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. And then Matthew continues on from there. But how interesting it is to me that in this genealogy, the opening paragraph of the New Testament, we don't have a reference to Sarah or Rebecca or Rachel. 
But the first woman in the genealogy of Jesus is Tamar. And I think we need to ask ourselves, why is that? Isn't that strange? Why, why do we have Tamar here but not the others? You know, we aren't told, but really, she has to be mentioned in Matthew for a reason. And my guess is that God does this to honor her, uh, but also to keep from excluding her. I mean, there, there's room in the genealogy of Jesus for some scandal, if we want to put it that way. These people are not perfect. You know, Jesus is one of us, isn't he? He is the Son of God, but we also need to realize he is also fully human. And he absolutely has some imperfection in his family tree. He's got this woman who pretended to be a prostitute. But let's not leave it on her. Jesus also has a man like Judah who ignored his daughter-in-law to the point where she had to take some very drastic steps to get his attention. And if God can use Tamar, if God can use Judah, uh, then I would suggest that he can also use us. And I think that's the encouragement that we get from Genesis chapter 38 tonight. And the other thing we need to realize tonight from Matthew chapter 1 is that the whole point of the Joseph story and the rest of Genesis is to keep Perez alive. You know, we read the book of Genesis and we read the, the last, basically the last third, almost the last half of the book. And we may think that Joseph is the main point of the rest of the book of Genesis. And he does play a huge role. It's very easy to see why we may think that Joseph is the leading character. But after this chapter that we've looked at tonight, I think we need to realize that Joseph is a tool. Uh, Joseph is being used by God for a reason. Joseph is not in the ancestry of Jesus. Perez is. So Joseph's job is to preserve the family tree through Perez. And so in a sense, Perez is the main point of the rest of the book of Genesis, even though he's only mentioned here and in Matthew. So we might say that Perez is the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus, if we want to put it in those terms. So Joseph, over the next several chapters, his job is to keep Perez and his descendants alive through the famine that's coming. Um, so that the Messiah can one day be born. All right, so um, next week in Genesis 39, we get back to Joseph. And uh, thank you for being with us tonight. I want to see most of you in person, if at all possible, this coming Lord's Day morning at 930. Um, I think we're getting back to Isaiah, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I thought, well, maybe we had enough Isaiah a few months ago, but no, it's just an amazing book, and I'm glad we're getting back to uh, finish up the rest of it. And then after class, we plan on coming back together at 1030 for the worship assembly and uh, getting back to the book of Hebrews. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we're very thankful for your providential care over your people. We look back and we're amazed at how you've been able to use flawed and weak and sinful people to accomplish your purpose. We pray, Father, that you would use us in any way that you see fit. And so tonight we make ourselves available and we recommit to doing whatever it is that you would have us to do. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.